remarkable the, the, the way in which the curators have held their nerve in continuing the practice over the 10 years. After we opened in 2000, there were institutions across Europe and America which suddenly started rotating their collections and putting them in new boxes and so on and so forth. Many of them have now abandoned that practice, have gone back to a much more conventional approach. And that may well respond to criticism from audiences initially. But frankly, I think people respect the institution if it has a set of principles that it's prepared to follow and work through and live with the mistakes, but then have some successes. Chronology is only one version of history, actually. But I think that an institution like the Tate is like the storyteller who needs to tell the story again in a different way to a very different audience every time. You cannot tell history in one way. You know, you have to invent perspectives, angles. And I think that's the role of such displays to, to um, make you enter into the, the history of, the, of art uh, from a specific point of view. Tate Modern's permanent collection is rearranged all the time. And over the years, the approach has got a lot more subtle genuinely opening up fresh ideas. This is kind of typical Tate Modern, where you're in a room that's called Claude Monet and Abstract Expressionism. Claude Monet is an artist who died in the 1920s, and the Abstract Expressionists, people like Jackson Pollock, only became famous in the 1940s and 1950s. So you've got an artist who depicts things, and artists who don't depict anything at all, who are entirely abstract and they're all circling around this picture, which does depict something. Now, how is that contrast going to work? Monet paints pictures of water lilies, so you can see exactly what they are, but your eyes are also opened to the amazing structured beauty that can be found in something so apparently unstructured as a bit of water. And from that kind of thing, the curators find a way to open your eyes to structure in entirely abstract art, using what they have in the collection. We've got a Jackson Pollock. It's not the height of Jackson Pollock's success, but it does do a lot of the good things that Jackson Pollock does. You've got a Mark Rothko. Again, it's not the best painting Rothko did, but it has many of the qualities that make Rothko great. And you've got a painting by a lady abstract expressionist called Joan Mitchell over there. She's nowhere near on the level of Rothko and Pollock. But nevertheless, the sort of shimmering effect that she's got going with those open marks connects with everything else that's going on in this room. And they all connect very, very happily with the shimmering, rich, exquisitely delicious surface of that Monet. Uh, Tate Modern is very good at shaking up the old sort of perhaps congested idea of the list of isms, you know, and what modern art is and what begat what. What is the general principle that is operating there? What are those rehangs about? Obviously they're about giving us insights into the way in which artists think about the world and indeed have thought about the world and occasionally have reacted the way in which they've reacted in response to the work of other artists. That's another room where I think the uh, Tate Modern curators are being typically Tate Modern. There's a big T-shaped metal sculpture. It's enormous. It's by the American artist Richard Serra. And there's a little geometric painting. It's by the Russian artist Kazimir Malievich. What I think is clever and thoughtful and sympathetic and sensitive about the juxtaposition is that that sculpture is so big, if it fell on you, it could kill you. So it's like he's literalizing and making theatrical the geometric shapes of modern art. 
those lovely wonky geometric shapes that Malevich deals with and that you see in uh, all sorts of modern art. So I think the uh, Tate Modern curators are being both clever here and rather sensitive. What the Tate curators have done is take away your anxiety that you need to know a lot of art history in order to get art. The way they put completely different works together kind of nudges you into thinking you really are making your own connections. The curves of a cartoon explosion in some pop art visually relate to the curves in a stylized body in a bit of futurism. It makes sense. As Tate Modern's branding people say, look again, think again. The opening your eyes effect can happen with art that is very historically important, or it can be art that is just a delightful joke. Absolutely nothing there is what it seems to be, and every single object is a carving, a painted carving made out of polystyrene. The cups, the biscuits, the plastic forks, the paintbrush, the box of party balloons, cigarette lighter, a box cutter, the plastic bowls, the cat food, the videotapes, nothing there is those things. They're all polystyrene carved into the shape and then carefully painted to look like any old junk left behind by the builder. I don't think you can really uh, applaud enough Tate Modern for putting that stuff on. Uh, the only people who deserve more applause are the artists, Fishley and Vice. It's one of those things where silliness is so monumental You've kind of got to take your hat off to it. Tate Modern's permanent collection is added to all the time as well as changed around. New work is either bought or acquired by donation. Recently, a lot of objects from the 60s have turned up. They fill out a historical gap in the collection and they connect to what goes on in present day contemporary art. The Italian 60s and 70s style movement Arte Povera, with its sculptures and paintings, forms the centre of a new display, together with videos and happenings from the same period. Curator Jessica Morgan explains the rationale. Partly being opportunistic, the works were available, they were within our price range, um, but also because we saw it as a, a very important moment in uh, recent develops in, in sculpture and also, in fact, leading into painterly practice as well. So you think things going on now in sculpture and indeed in painting are sort of foreshadowed, in a way, by stuff from the 60s and 70s? Absolutely. I mean, we're still seeing artists um, sort of returning to these, these very simple actions. This very simple work by Bruce Nauman that we, we actually bought just in the last year which is the uh, sort of resin cast of a shape. We can think of Rachel Whiteread, of course, whose work has been right. so influenced by Nauman. Yeah. Or this work by Keith Sonier next to it, which was, again, a new acquisition. Which the is thing. Exactly, yes. And I think what's, what's important in this room, too, is that, of course, Arte Povera, it's an Italian title that's focused around a group of Italian artists. But here we're talking about two Americans. We've got a piece by a Japanese artist, Kojimura, over there. So part of what we've been interested in here, especially, and, and in general, with the collection is saying, OK, you know, we may think that this happened in Italy, but in fact, it was happening in all these other places, that there was a spirit of the time. There are established trends of art that we all know about, but what Tate Modern wants to show is that some of these have historical precedents. They've just acquired a video from the 1970s by artist Anna Mendieta, a woman shamanistically transforming herself with blood and feathers. It could be Tracy Emin in the 1990s and the 2000s doing video art about anxious selfhood. This is the art that we own. It belongs to us, the public. We can stare at it, we can take it seriously or not, we can think what we want about it whenever we like for free. With all this success, what's next for Tate Modern? So much stuff, so many visitors, 